two birdies at the mm. start, two birdies at the end. If anyone is not into golf, birdies are good. Are they now? They what are, are good. What's a birdie at the end, Ginny? Thank you very much. Right, so a, there's a, a, a course, right? And say yeah. if it's a par three, for yeah. instance, um, then you're like, a birdie is one less than that. Okay. So gotcha. it's, she would get a shot in two. What's an eagle? An eagle is three less. Checking. And an albatross is four. <laughs> yeah, they're all bird references. <laughs> Where Thank you guys for trying to like, <laughs> trying to like, this, I do not like this at all. Oh my God, I miss Macker. Oh. Play by Play on Sports Joe and Her. Brought to you by AIG. In support of 20 by 20. Record breaking races, LPGA triumphs, sold out stadiums. It's not been a bad week. It's about to get that little bit better. Two panelists on the show. Episode 24, I'm Jenny Murphy and this is Play by Play. Lads, thanks for thanks for coming on board. Tanya, I guess I'll introduce you first. Uh, rugby player, capped 58 times, was a scary scrum half, and then kind of grew more nurturing as your career progressed. Thanks very much for coming on. You're welcome. I didn't really give you enough time to like battle that, no, but we'll get, in, no. we'll get into that later, so it's all good. Uh, Ruth Fai, we've heard your voice throughout the Women's World Cup on RC. Not bad stuff. Uh, football player, wannabe Gaelic footballer, Mackers has told me that you're not too bad. I'm not too good though, to be honest. I'm yeah. A complete soccer head trying to play Gaelic. It was more like a self experimentation thing. And uh, yeah, it went not great, but all right. I, no, from <laughs> what she's saying, it's gone pretty good. Like, obviously, <laughs> trying to introduce the offside rule to Sylvester's is not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> but like, other than that, you're like, yeah, it's like, it's just push up, lads. It makes sense. Yeah. It make... <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, this is a good start. It only took. How many, four intros this time? And for anyone listening at home, yeah. they've been marking down how many times I've already screwed up. So I really appreciate the support that you're giving me so far. Sound lots. Uh, before we go into in-depth into all the good stuff that you've done, uh, let's jump first into some of the amazing stuff that other athletes um, from around Ireland and beyond have done. Have any of you been keeping abreast of the athletics and the amazing stuff that's gone on in Doha? Yeah, big time. Um, I would I could sit and watch athletics for hours, and especially because it's so topical at the moment. Obviously, not all all positive, negative too. But yeah, it was an incredible week week of athletics and huge achievements. And I'm sure we'll go on to talk about that particular Irish one as well. So I, I love watching it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we've been watching it, and Serge, my son, has been watching it, and it's really interesting because Serge has been brought up around a female athlete, so he tends to look at the female athletes a lot more than most boys would. Thank God. But um. Great. The race was amazing. I just I can't believe it. Top 10 finish. Mm. Where was she Some ranked? Some of the best in the world. I, I actually don't know where she's ranked, but like just even the build-up was amazing. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen the interview after the game. We're going to show it now and have a listen because not only is she an amazing runner, but her post-match interviews are on the money. So the woman that we have, of course, been talking about, uh, Port Ferry woman, Kira McGeen, uh, 1,500 metre now 10th best in the world. Let's have a look at what you had to say after that race. Kieran McGean, top 10 in the world, a PB in a World Championship final. How are you feeling? Look, I'm, I'm absolutely over the moon. I came in and said I would throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. I did, that pace went out hard. Talked to my coach beforehand and we did discuss what it might go like. And listen, I know there's girls out there that have ran 356. I'm just not there yet, but Whenever the pace went, I said, OK, Kira, don't de get disheartened. You're at the back of the field, but that's OK. Came into this co competition probably ranked 14th or 16th, I think. Came 10th in the world. That's not a bad place for a wee girl from Port of Ferry. What an absolute ledge. Uh, 10th place, that was like the fastest. That was the fastest 1,500 metres in, in history? history. Yeah. Yeah. And like her, four, what is it, four, me four, four minutes split, one five oh, seconds? Yeah. That's disgusting. Like I was <laughs> well, watching. I, I hate running. Okay, I, I know but you I hate running. I love watching it. Yeah, and, and the intensity of, of, of the race and things like. But I love watching her. Her interview is amazing. I'd love to go out partying with her because she just <laughs> looks so much crack. You know. Yeah. Talking about her family and things like that. It's so nice seeing an athlete just letting it go rather than oh I'm going to stay professional here. I'm going to stay within the boundaries of what I should be saying. So I think she's she's a breath of fresh air. She's great. I think as well, like obviously, like you get to talk to a lot of the soccer players after and around, but sometimes it's so nice that you can like, oh, they like you, you train so hard for that race or for that match, and for it to 
be authentic and like generally show mm. how much you give a shit about it whatever it sometimes can be so refreshing because a lot of the time like I know for me anyway it was kind of especially when you're chucked in front of journalists for the first time you don't want to mess up and you don't want to say the mm. wrong thing and you want to be professional and or whatever that yeah. entails and sometimes it's kind of like well I've seen athletes on TV or in the media give these really serious kind of stoic reviews or yeah rigid end. reviews yeah. and like I think maybe when you get a little bit older it's like ah it's grand like I really care about this and like yeah. I think that's it exactly it's age and experience and maturity because you're seeing a trend now with younger athletes especially in soccer I've even seen it with the Irish girls who get interviewed afterwards and they're yeah like that it's more the fear of saying the wrong thing as opposed to embracing the right thing and embracing your emotion at that time and that's what McGeehan did at that point like she's so emotionally charged but just so proud of herself and like that's that's so engaging isn't it like yeah, it really right. is it's great to see and she was just the way she was saying she so proud to wear the vest and she wants to do it again she wants to get better and also she pinpointed like the mental part of that race as well that you often forget about because we think athletics is pure physical dominance and speed and, and just pure conditioning but it's seeing the likes of Safan Hassan breaking away so quickly knowing, yes, you probably aren't going to catch her, nobody's going to catch her, but also knowing that you're still in this race, you're still she running your race. She might get caught, but maybe not by a runner. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't oh. say that. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but running your own race regardless. And, and again, just finishing like that and having that interview, yeah, it was just really, really nice to see. Yeah, I think mentally athletics is really tough because it's such an individual sport. Mm. So like you said, if someone breaks away in a race and you're at the back of the pack, do you stop and just break down or do you just push on and she did she did that she pushed on right through which was nice to see interviews are really hard for young athletes I just you know when I remember going into rugby and being told this is what you need to cover this is what you shouldn't cover you know mm. whereas with experience you you move on you grow and you're able to adapt better in, in the situation so it was nice to see that side have you guys gotten media training actually as I've never seen that in action I always wonder what are you told are you told kind of not to say or avoid certain things or how does how does I, that work? I know in, in when I was with the Sevens, we got, I think, a 40-minute media training. Mm. Um, and it was, I, I, his name was Kieran, he was the Kiwi, and he was just like, listen, just be, you're allowed, you're allowed to get emotional and you're allowed to show, like, you, you know, if you're frustrated or you're, yeah. like, ecstatic, that's okay to show that on yeah. camera. But he, but make sure that you're the one in control of that because you need to remember that that's going to be a YouTubeable moment that is there for everyone to see. They will like they'll Google your name and that's the first thing that that's that's going to come up. So, kind of when you have that in the back of your head, that's terrifying. Yeah, the you're, fear, and like, it takes the over. fear, <laughs> and then as well, especially when you come off a game. And either, either if it's gone driven. your way or not, you're like yeah, yeah insane like. In 2014, we played against France and we lost. And I threw a ball that was intercepted and cost us the game. And like we did loads of other mistakes as well. Loads but of other yeah, mistakes. Yeah, we did cost loads. Us the game. We did loads of other things. Yeah. But you know, at the, like at the time you were, as well, you're like yeah. that was on me. And I remember, I can't remember which senior player it was, but I made a beeline for the dressing room because I was not in a fit state to. If someone stuck a camera in front of me, like. God knows yeah, what, what I would have said. Yeah. So I was kind of like nicely being like, get inside or whatever <laughs> and like ball on your own yeah. in the corner. But yeah, I think it's, and then as you get older, it's... Yeah, it gets a bit easier. But like when we're at the World Cup, I don't know if you remember, Jenny, we, like, we weren't allowed to mention if someone was injured or, or anything like that that was coming up in case other teams used it. Of course, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but we didn't get a lot of media training. I was lucky I went off and worked with a couple of guys, but that was on, the, on my own back, like... I don't think they offer enough out there to the athletes. Well, I, you know, through my career, I think, like you said, one 40-minute slot, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And in that, it was like you cover the kind of basics as well, like as in if you have an x-ray or if you have an injury and it's particularly gruesome or looks kind of cool, don't, don't. put it online yeah. because that will be used against you by the opposition team. Yeah. So, yeah, little things like that, you're like, oh, God, I never would have yeah. thought about that. Like, I remember the whole age thing when I was at the last World Cup. Tanya's age and it's like oh, just stop talking about my age like <laughs> I'm not that old you know but it was yeah. you know so yeah it's interesting because I remember reading articles about other teams and seeing what was going on there and you go oh hmm she's got a sore knee today yeah. what's going to happen tomorrow that kind of thing but 
Um, so I'm really just really intrigued because it's getting like stricter and tighter and just less watchable interviews. And that's why that interview in particular was just so good to watch, just so infectious. Mm. Mm. It really was. And you just want to see more of her. And you just want to, you want to follow her story as well, which was another result of seeing her. But yeah, it was incredible. It really was. Because like, do you notice that when like, like um, athletes or, you know, football players, soccer players, when they're, when they're playing and they're in the middle of the career, sometimes it's like, oh, they're great footballers. And it's only when they retire that you're like, you find out a bit more about their personality, yeah. which is, is fine. Like they don't, you're not under any obligation to give any part of yourself to the media. Like that's your own privacy. But sometimes I think for fans, it's and nice it's to great. see this. It's nice to see, like yeah. even like 2020 and stuff, yeah. and it's great that you get to, you get to know a bit. Like it's, I think once you know an athlete a little bit more, there's more emotional investment yeah. in it. So it can be, I think but it's, it makes them real, I think. Like when you look at a, a football player, it, like the kids look at them like, oh, they're the superstars. Mm. But when they start bringing in their family and things like that, they're like, oh, they're real people. I can become this person. So I think it's nice to know a little bit more about the athletes. Um, 100%. That's just a striking image, sorry, of the Instagram post World Cup celebrations of the, of the USA women's national team. I'm just like that's how you celebrate <laughs> yeah, yeah. just that okay not every team has to go to that length so to, you don't have to publicize yeah whatever you want I guess but you don't have to do that but that was yeah that was amazing wasn't it? I mean these these players who have dedicated their whole life to this under so much pressure gonna achieve that and they are just letting go and it was just yeah it was really good to see well hopefully we'll see more more celebrations well m not that crazy and um, <laughs> like not too crazy <laughs> not on Tuesday but yeah because uh Kira Megan she's flying back and she's going to be at the game in Tal Stadium so we'll obviously delve into a bit more of that later on but she can make it all the way from Doha so hopefully nice. everyone else can because well it's not meant to be 100% but that's why we have waterproofs so yep, it's all good. Um, yeah, before we jump into soccer, we've got to talk about golf. So our golf correspondent, Neve McAvoy, is currently off sunning herself and getting probably a nice tan. Um, I probably have to say nice stuff about her. Um, but we'll talk about, are any of you guys golf aficionados? Oh, leave no. it to you, Tanya. <laughs> no, not really. I just, I just, you just passed it on her. Yeah, that was a like hospital it. pass. I will say one thing, though. Quick, and New Zealand golfer, Lydia Ko, is well known in New Zealand. She's... Everyone knows it. Mm. So I'm quite amused that the Irish golfers aren't put out a bit more. Ah, oh, well, like I, th I think you, I think golf over here, it's 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 gradually getting, you know, a, like we we <laughs> get we we bandwagon. Yeah, and we when, jump when, on, and, yeah, and, and we when support. Teams, yeah, but it's yeah. the same. I think it's for that's not just for for and then as well, golf is a bit more of a difficult sport. It's not as accessible. No. So when you see someone like Leona Maguire or Stephanie Meadows, and they're like great twenty by twenty ambassadors as well, and they're getting the wins too. That yeah, hopefully we'll see more of them in the papers as well, yeah. mm -hmm. and more maybe some good interviews and stuff too. So they had a pretty exciting weekend. I don't know if you've like yeah, finished it. So it. they've so Maguire. We kind of she was going to go in fairly comfortable. Um, she needed to finish in the top ten to get on this money card in order to be, you know, on the money card for this LPGA tour. I hope I'm not butchering it up now. Like I've done my notes and I feel like I've properly he prepped, but I wish, really good, I wish, really I wish, I wish Macker was here. <laughs> anyway, uh, she finished joint thirty third, so she's in good to go. And the more stressful situation was definitely for Antrim native uh, Stephanie Meadow, who needed to, she, yeah, it was, it was really close. She had a really good start. And then on day three, she... Had a stumble. Yeah, had a little bit of a stumble. But it all worked out. She was all good in the end. So she needed to finish in the top 10 in a different tournament. So she was in Texas. Yes. And Maguire was in Florida. Oh, maybe it was the other way around. Anyway, they were both in America. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then she had to yeah, finish top 10, dropped, and then got a two over par, 73 on Sunday. So she was eight shots off the pace going into the final. Um, and then she, what, she, yeah, first, she produced the stunning round. Like she was, and the last, uh, yeah, and the yeah, last Yeah, 67. Seven. So two birdies at the mm. start, two birdies at the end. If anyone is not into golf, birdies are good. Are they now? They what are, are good. What's a birdie there, Ginny? Thank you very much, right? So a, there's a, a, a course, <laughs> right? And say yeah. if it's a par three, for yeah. instance, um, then you're like, a birdie is one less than that. Okay. So gotcha. it's, she would get a shot in two. What's an eagle? 
an eagle is three less. Checking. And an albatross is four. <laughs> yeah, they're all bird references. <laughs> Thank you guys for trying to like, <laughs> trying to like, this, I do not like this at all. Oh my God, I miss Macker. Oh, Christ. Anyway, we'll get to you later. I've got some dirt on both of you, so whatever. Nice. Um, yeah, well, none of you Denied are invited it. to the <laughs> Golf Classic. With Jackie Hurley, uh, Valerie Mulcahy, Neve McAvoy, um, they've all gone on like golf, golf, uh, golfing tours or trips. Well, like to Dublin or something. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, like, somebody yeah, so like, I'm Dublin. determined to get involved with that um, as well. So you're not invited. Okay, you might so, need to do okay. speed golf though. Uh, no, I would I, definitely be doing like one where you're in pairs and they use your partner's best, best shot because I'm not going gotcha. to. Yeah, I'll be a caddy. I'll yeah. carry two caddy bags. Yeah, I'll be a caddy too because you get paid good money. Yeah, but I'll I've seen you in the gym and you can't lift, so uh, ex no. ex Now, let's talk about lifting. Oh, God. For my weight ratio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's talk about lifting. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly along from there, um, we'll have to speak about the incredible feats of Cora Staunton. Uh, so she had a horrific leg break um, with the Giants five months ago. Um, I think she broke it in like, she broke it in a couple of places. Um, and then she lined out to play for her club team. Mm. Um, I think she got a score in her first kick, like, she, like five months mm. coming back from that and getting back on the pitch is huge. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, isn't it? Like, and I don't want to push the age thing, but at 37, that is just immense. Mm. And like, she doesn't appear to be slowing down or anything like that. And I, I don't know if you've had a big injury. I know you have, Jenny. Did, yeah. did you do your ACL as well? Um, I did mine, like, and uh, just even, never mind getting back physically and everything like that, but coming back and I had huge problems with confidence in my left leg because I lost quite a lot of muscle mass in my quad and so on and hamstring graft whatsoever. But to come back and first of all, be ready physically on the pitch, but then have the confidence, your ability to just turn. Mm. Was it her first touch or something or something outrageous? Yeah, she and just came on over? as a sub. I think yeah. Laura Dow Louise Dowling, um, she replaced Louise Dowling, came on, and yeah, I think, it, yeah, popped over the bar. Yeah, just yeah. massive respect. I think though, when you're an athlete at that level, you'll do anything to come back. When you love a sport, you'll do anything. Like I remember, so I've done both my shoulders, dislocated surgery on both, and my knee. And when you love a sport, and you're at your prime or your peak of your fitness, you want to get back as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure her physio and medical team were really good, are really good. Yeah. They have to be. Of course. Um, and that's probably why she's able to come back so quickly. And then alongside that, I'm sure she had a sports cycle, something helping her, or someone mean with your mental state. Because I remember going into my physio going, I can't do this. My physio, my physio is doubled as a psychiatrist. Yeah, oh, like 100%. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you it's, have yeah, to. Yeah, it's because it's horrible. It's not physically, even if they tell you, like, because some, some of them will tell you, like, this is, could be a career ender, and that's, that's, fine. that's crap. Mm -hmm. No. So crap. But I think, well, for me, I'm stubborn enough to be like, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's like, because you're, you're at your most vulnerable, it's, you mm -hmm. know, he or she is working on you, whatever, and you're just kind of unloading, I had a bad week, or this is not great. Yeah. Um, but it's all mental. Like, especially when it's, an injury like I've just with the knee was like a roller coaster of yeah. you've had your good days and then you've had like dire like crappy days mm. as well so I think it's more as impressive as this is physically like mentally, mentally coming is. back from it is just because like I like the confidence thing is huge my first game back after so my first game back after um, I had my double back fracture was against UL Bose which had a whole oh, host of Irish gosh, players <laughs> and it was kind of like and I got absolutely floored straight away and I was like oh Grant I'm, mm. I'm good and didn't You're think okay, about yeah. it and then with the knee injury it was kind of different because it still it still feels mm. not the same and it's fine it's always going to be like that but I just have to work around that and, mm. and build up and it takes yeah. a little bit longer but like my first game back was against Munster down in Munster um, and it was just like I was more nervous going into that game than my first cap game. Yeah, it was just, really? yeah. yeah. Like squeeze guard? Or what was the emotion you could... Yeah, like it was, like I, I would catch myself. I was like, I would catch myself kind of being like, oh, that's a, that's a scary thought there. And that would be, and then I'd instead be like, okay, how strong is, I'd be like, I'd nearly be talking about my leg being like, it's able to lift this, this amount on its run. own yeah. and it's able to do this. And like, yeah. like a normal person, like it's silly things where a normal person can't do that and I can do that. And it's, and, and instead of, and even little things like a lot of people would be like, how's your bad knee? 
and like if something bad needs my new knee yeah like it's little things like that and those yeah. constant because when i did my knee like i had albie mccormick and he's amazing physio and he used to be lion's physio and the irish men's physio and every session is like this knee is better than before you did it this knee is so much stronger and constantly every time i went in there it was like your knee is better than da 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 tanya it's gonna be fine and then i go he's like right you're going back to training no you're not strapping it you don't need it strapped yeah, you know, yeah. it's kind of that. Tell me you yeah, that. just and like definitely. If I had any other physio, I don't know whether I would have got that same treatment or. And I remember going back to training, going, "No, I'm okay, I'm fine." Yeah. And then you get tackled, and you're like, "Okay, this is fine." And then I remember going into a game, and the team physio saying to me, "You need to strap your knee," but yet Albie had told me I didn't need to, and like going, "Oh, I'm caught between two medical <laughs> yeah. teams here. What am I going to do?" But mentally, having someone that's able to get you through those injuries. And, and, and as well, it's like the, the kind of tough love of being like, stop, yeah. stop being like, as in there's a time and a place for that. Yeah. But sometimes you just need to kick up the ass and you're like, no, like yeah. this happens to other people all the time. It's not a woe is me. It's just get on with it. Like, what else are you going to do? Yeah. Or you can have your mother ring you and say, take a spoonful of cement and hard. <laughs> That's what she did. I yeah. dislocated my shoulder at the 2010 World Cup and I ring, ring back to New Zealand. That's Tanya, you need a spoonful of cement and harden up. You just stay there and play. Now, I didn't stay there and play, but yeah. some tough yeah. love sometimes is... See, those are all such key points because I did my ACL and I did like the meniscus cartilage as well, but just outside the season. So we had finished off as a 2015-16 season with Wexford Youths and we just won the league in a playoff. And then two weeks later, I definitely hadn't recovered properly. Definitely on the pace for two weeks celebrating and played the Salt Hill Fives. <laughs> yep. Uh, just own it <laughs> just own it yeah, yeah. I was hydrating <laughs> I just wasn't yeah I wasn't right played the Saltel Fives to be fair which is meant to be quite a, a casual mm. half social kind of half competitive thing down in Galway um, and I was just playing up front I'm not a striker like I was bouncing around thinking I was the bee's knees and kind of went in for half a tackle and just completely crunched it but the fact was I was outside the season I wasn't going to make it back for the next season so I was completely unaffiliated with the club and I didn't okay. have that support now that's a whole different line of argument uh, you know I did have that time with the club I was fairly bitter we I didn't have that relationship which is a real pity but like I didn't have the mental support and I was just useless like I really was mm -hmm. I, I I just moved to Dublin just got a new job and um, loads of stuff going on in the background and just didn't rehab properly and I had to wait six months to get the surgery as well so injured in June surgery in December and that time in between because I had to wait to straighten out the scar tissue um, and it just yeah, I think I added an extra year in my rehab, like totally my own fault, I have to say. So I'll know for again if whatever happens. Yeah, but it's like, like kick, when stuff like that, like, yeah, but you crap, do, like, you do learn. Like I was lucky that my first big injury that I had, I did it playing for Ireland. Mm -hmm. So they had to look after me. And as well as that, I had um, a housemate. So I was living with Ayla Egan, who's the tight head prop. And she was very good at being like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're like, there was a, a good keep solid going. mix of comforting and like, come on, let's keep going. And that motivation was there. So yeah. then when I did my knee, I did it outside of Ireland. So I wasn't covered and you're completely on your own and you have to do the gym sessions on your own. Yeah. And like, you know, you sort out the, your physio and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, okay, I need to, I've had practice at this before. I know what I have to do. Yeah. I think if it was yeah, the, way around, the other way around, I, I would have been screwed. Yeah. Like, cause I just, I didn't know. Yeah. Like, and then as well as that, it's like, like the thing as well, it's like mentally just yeah. draining, but. Yeah, true. Anyway, this has been enjoyous, this <laughs> chat so <laughs> far. It's like, what a so trip like, down memory lane. It's like sport and get injured. Yeah. <laughs> but like, okay. yeah, back to Nora. What's the yeah. What ledge? Here, actually, so even though you're sick of people talking about your age and stuff like that, and like Cora being 37 doing that, you retired. Yep. Came back. And then did it again. Like, firstly, because I find that right. So yesterday I was out and bumped into um, a guy that I knew and he was there with his kids. And he kind of said, oh, this is a former rugby player. And inside I was like, like, not, I'm injured. Mm -hmm. I haven't, uh, there's I haven't nothing retired. official. Yeah. And it was just like, but you just smile <laughs> and you kind of get on with it. How did you, like, how did you manage that? I left. I retired from rugby because I was in a bad state, mentally in a bad state. I got injured, um, felt I wasn't treated too nicely, um, and I wasn't enjoying it. I, and like I, when I play rugby, I want to play rugby because I loved it, yeah. not nothing else. And it wasn't for 
we didn't get paid or anything like that. It's just a pure love of playing rugby. So I needed the break. And Greg McWilliams actually convinced me to come back. He sat down with me and um, sold me a little story <laughs> that I brought into. Um, but it was, it was transitioning. It came out okay, I, though. It came out okay. Yeah. <laughs> it did work out okay, you know. We did well at the World Cup and, and that. But it went from me playing really good cl club rugby and enjoying club rugby and loving rugby again to then getting asked back into the Irish setup, which was brilliant. And then we went into the 2014 World Cup and had an outstanding campaign there. I mean, we lost uh, France in our last disappointing match. But I think because my love came back and I was physically and mentally ready for it again. How long was probably were you out? Nearly retired. three years, okay. three, three or four years. So 2010, yeah, you, you... I retired after the 2010 World Cup. Yeah. Then I came back for the 2014 World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing yeah. to come back and get straight to that level so quickly as well. Yeah, and it was funny because leading up, I wasn't thinking about um, getting into the squad. The only thing I wanted to do during that season, and I'll, and I'll say this here, is I wanted to show everyone that I was the best scrum half in the country, even though I wasn't in that squad. That was the only purpose of me pushing myself hard for that season. And I enjoyed my club season, so when I enjoy rugby, I play better. I, I, well, I think I play better. Um, and that was my goal. And it wasn't my goal, it wasn't to come back to play for the Irish team. It was just to love rugby. And Greg, Greg, Greg sold, sold me an attacking game that I loved. Also sold me a culture that was built around you girls and how well you guys had done leading up to it. Um, and the culture had changed, um, which was nice, and how, more, how professional it was, it was. So that kind of, he sold it to me, in fairness, to go back. And then the support of Simon and, you know, Serge was able to travel across the World Cup with us, so... Yeah. yeah, Simon's husband, Serge, chap, and then no, Greg, and Greg now is doing really well. He's the backs coach for the Eagles, the, uh, Eagles, the United States men's team as well. Yeah. So he's oh, yeah, yeah, he's really good. You know, and he's a big loss to um, Irish, Irish rugby. rugby. Yeah, especially for Irish women's rugby. You know, it, it's a pity that we didn't keep him within the country to carry on because he was such a good coach, and he, not only technically in that on the pitch. But for the girls off the pitch and man management and things like that, he just got the whole set up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he's a big loss to Irish rugby. Well, I think that was one of... So um, Goose was our head coach at the time and that's what I think... So he's now Philip coaching... Doyle. Philip Doyle. Philip Doyle, sorry. Yeah, Love Top Gun man, reference, man, yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. No um, explanation Top Gun reference, yeah. <laughs> and he's now coaching the Scotland women's team. Yes. Um, they were actually away in South Africa the weekend for their two tests away which is kind of cool um yeah but he was I think a coach without an ego so mm. he's like I'm not good at this so I'm going to bring in someone new that's very good and better than me in this area because it will benefit the team and Greg was one of those guys and we we're lucky that there was a few good guys that got roped in and had a bit of it crack can't. it was yeah and then did you find that then after 2015 got a Six Nations medal as well that you were like okay was it i I'm in a good place now, or...? Yeah, you know, it was, it was odd, because 2014, at the end of 2014, a lot of the girls decided to retire. Mm. And then I saw a whole new lot coming through, and I was just like, do we all go and leave them to transition in? Or do I stay and help them transition in? And I decided to stay on. Was that my favourite year? <laughs> Probably not. Should I have retired after the 2014? Looking back now, probably, because that was my best year. That was, you know, I, I love the 20, 2015 squad as such, but it wasn't my favourite year of rugby. It was a tough year, but I stayed on to try and help nurture the new girls coming in because I just thought when I was there, I remember the girls like Kiwi and them when I arrived and, and they looked after me. And I, my thought was, who's going to look after now that Lynn and Fee and all them have gone? Now Fee's scary. She wouldn't be so much of the nurturing. <laughs> less nurturing. Yeah, less, but who was she going, drives standards she in her own She drives standards way. and expectations, yeah. just like myself. But, who, you know, you had Aoife Doyle coming in, you had H Hannah Terrell, you know, all those young ones. Who was going to look after it? Because there's strong personalities in the Irish women's team back then. There's probably still are now, but it, that was the reason why I really stayed on that 2015. But winning Six Nations that year was great. So then, yeah. I suppose. Bag yeah. a try at the end as well. Bag try at the end against yeah. Scotland, you know, because I don't score many of those because I'm a passing scrum half. Fourth. <laughs> oh, she, dro she drops that. <laughs> she drops that all the time. Where I was yeah. like, I was waiting for it. Like, what type of scrum half? Um, 
Well, we'll have to. We'll, we'll, we'll get back into the men's because something, yeah. a weather warning could happen. But before we delve a little bit further into that, um, Ireland, Tuesday night, Tala Stadium, sold out crew. Hopefully it's sold out. So there's 8,000 tickets now gone. Um, exciting. How do you think it's, you're looking forward yeah, to Yeah, it's, I don't know. I always get a bit nervous about these kind of evenings because it, you can't underestimate it's such a massive game. Like it's an absolutely huge game. Just the way the way the group pans out, the composition of the group. Um, I know we were saying earlier, Vera Pau, the new manager, has acknowledged that Germany are going to win this. They've just absolutely hammered Ukraine 8 0, home and away already. They've beaten Montenegro 10 0. Like this team, they had a really poor World Cup. They're looking to bounce back ferociously and they're doing that already. So I think they're going to step away. Whereas in the past, managers would have been like, oh, you know, we, we're still aiming to get results. Like she's kind of said, look, they're at their own level. We're battling out for second place here. So Ukraine are second seeds, Ireland are third seeds. Ukraine and Ireland, very close. Kind of historically, Ukraine have only ever qualified for one tournament, uh, one major tournament passed in 2009. So that was a little while ago. They came third in their qualifying group for the World Cup as well. Same amount of points. Um, they're just very similar. Like on paper, I'd say the Irish girls are miles ahead. Just looking at the Ukrainian side, most of them play domestically. I think probably the fact they have a longer established professional league makes them stronger in one sense. But like looking at our team now, it's just the likes of Tyler Tolan, Man City, Louise Quinn and Katie McCabe established now at Arsenal. Um, we've got girls playing in Germany. We've got Megan Campbell coming back in. Like... They're just more quality they're individuals quality, that yeah, can make like a difference. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. Um, so for that reason, like you go in with huge confidence, but obviously you've got that kind of memory in the past where they've come across the second seeds. Like four years ago, what happened against Portugal? They started out away against Portugal, beat them one 0 It was going to open up the whole group, and then lost at home. So there's a little bit of trepidation in that sense, but it's all lined up for something incredible here. Like there's no, there's no point in underestimating it either. Like it's yeah. it. it it could and should be something huge and the fact Vera Pau is in and Eileen Gleeson, who I know you played under with P-Mount, brings that kind of domestic level of expertise as well. I think they're a good partnership. The players are well set up and hopefully, it's, I really, really hope it's a sellout as well because they deserve it. Do you think her stating that she's not going for Germany, that she's going for Ukraine, is a good focus? Like, it's, you know, it hasn't opened it up like for expectations to do well against Germany so mm. they can take that limelight off that game and the girls just focus on this game? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a, the right approach, yeah, to yeah. be fair, I do, because it's not a long campaign. There's only five in the group. They've got Ukraine on Tuesday this week, and then they've got Greece back-to-back, -back, have to be Greece back-to-back, -back, Montenegro, and then they've only three games left. It's Germany away and home. If you take those games out, it's only Ukraine away. So that's just a really quick synopsis of the group and the way it's going to pan out. But I think, yeah, I think she's right, and I respect mm -hmm. that, and I think... It, takes a little bit of pressure, pressure off the girls off the girls in one sense and in the other sense of course they have to go out and do the business um, but they're so capable they're mature now they've grown up a little bit and they know each other that little bit better as well so hopefully it'll be a good match as well but of course the win is, is number one so they got a, two goals against Montenegro we're going to show a clip of that plus some of our first memories of playing sport we're going to have a look at that and then we're going to ask you some questions about your first mm -hmm. first memories of football as well so let's have a look of the gamers so will be patience just about patience where I'm just looking at that Montenegro back forwards flat back the first memory I have of football when I was growing up was my brother playing my first memory of football is my dad bringing me to the local football team and bribing me with ice creams to go I grew up playing football with Leanne Kiernan who is now on the Irish women's soccer team my favorite memory of soccer is Rahilti primary school back in the day in Tipperary Early shot, off, oh, and go. Well, the goalkeeper didn't cover herself in glory in the match against Germany when she conceded 10. But my goodness me, and what a way to celebrate your first for your country. He unfortunately didn't make the team that he wanted to make. I started playing soccer when I was nine years old. My first memory of soccer is going to Lansdowne Road. One of our teachers brought us there. So the rule in the house was you go to Irish dancing three times and if you don't like it then you never go again. Um, I was terrible at Irish dancing so I never went again. Oh, Sullivan in there. So Sullivan again. There was this one girl who really wants to make the team as well but there was no girls teams. We were the only girls 
school there to see the Ireland uh, men's team playing. The boys didn't like the girls playing, but we got picked anyway. So my mother, who had absolutely no experience in football whatsoever, uh, decided to make a team and girls could play and boys could play. My cousin actually was playing for a team Bradford Rovers and I was really, it looked really fun, so I decided to get involved. Toland wants it, but it's back with Fahey instead. Fahey rolls it on for Toland. After the second training session, there was only myself and another girl, D, on the pitch. Um, no one was passing me the ball, so I slide tackled one of my own teammates, fell in love with the game, and I no longer needed ice cream to convince me to rock up to a training session. I didn't actually make the team though, but uh, I was allowed to bring the oranges to the training, so that was my first memory. That was kind of my, re my first real experience seeing someone do so well in women's sport and to see her progress so much through the years. It's a penalty. And it's Katie McCabe who's going to take it. On October 8th, I'll be at Tallis Stadium supporting the Irish women's soccer team, hoping that they get through to the next big tournament and giving the next generation of young girls precious memories like I have. No mistake. Keeper never moved. I'm really looking forward to seeing her now and playing soccer on the field in Tallis Stadium. He did under the keeper and then that was in. And that allows Ireland just a little bit... So that video we made because we were like wanted to promote all the tickets being sold out and they did so go well us. Done. Yeah, that's all on us. And um, we just need to make sure that people get their butts there. It's going to be a cracker. What are your first memories of football, Ruth? Um, I think it was the World Cup in 94. I was living in Malahide at the time uh, with my three siblings and my dad brought us all out and got us the World Cup t-shirts and a really cool little white cap and we used to have kind of the road the road party so every neighbour would have a separate match like hosted in their house and just go in don't remember the matches remember eating lots of popcorn and sweets and coke and getting hyper but yeah it was amazing was and it. did you have that for like for the Women's World Cup did your family like gather together and be like that's our daughter's voice <laughs> maybe they did actually I'm not too sure but uh no they were my family are gas, like they, they get more excited about hearing my voice than I like I can't list myself back at all. Um I hear you. They yeah. yeah, at all. So they like to tell me what I said and I just can't have that either. So no, I'm not allowed I'm not allowed to hear anything about what they're doing when they're watching. So I'd like to think yes, they oh, do that. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. My my brother likes any time I say something stupid, which is three or four times a show, um yeah, he'll let me know about it. He's <laughs> Merciless. Really? It's, it's horrible. Yeah, I prefer yeah. that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like, it's something just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if, it's, if it's really nice things, then I'm suspicious it's and I'm like, really it went really and you're bad. like, no, no, like, I was actually shit. And you know, you know <laughs> yeah. if, if you were shit and they're saying nice things, you prefer just to be ripped. You know? yeah. yeah. So I know that you're not the biggest football fan. So I'll ask you the same question, but with the oval shaped ball. Um, first memory of rugby has probably been carted around watching my brothers play um, back in New Zealand. And I remember going, and they used to in New Zealand, they play barefoot rugby, frozen grounds, cold, mm. ice everywhere. And watching my, my two brothers play and thinking, this is awesome. This is what I want to, want to play. And knowing I'd never get to play it because mum mom and dad would never let me play it. So well, did you, did you do netball and then? When, I like... did netball. And then to play rugby back in New Zealand, I played touch rugby and played um, New Zealand touch and all that kind of stuff at a young age. And then I had to climb out of the window to go and play rugby matches. <laughs> Wait, so your your parents didn't know that you were playing? No. Really? No, no, they didn't. The first time they watched me play, actually, it was quite funny. It was in the Canada World Cup in 2006. It was the first time mum and dad ever watched me play rugby. Now, mum and dad love rugby, and they love the rugby local rugby club and support Tamatea and go, went to all my brother's matches, but they never watched me in New Zealand and they wouldn't allow me. What, just too physical? Were... Yeah, mum, mum thought I, I should focus on netball which I was okay at but I wasn't great at it and I was really good at touch rugby um, and, and that she just thought at the time rugby wasn't for for girls wow. so yeah the little venture of putting the knife in the door so you couldn't open it it's on the outside <laughs> and jump out the window smart yeah. don't so, do that uh, kids don't do that did, so did you get caught or it was only when you were like times over in Ireland and there was a safe distance away <laughs> that then you were like by the way I'm playing full contact rugby I think Dad kind of knew about it, um, but didn't say much because he loved rugby so much. Um, 
And mum might have heard. I, no, actually, she did hear because I played one of my games and I got two or three tries. And so the girls would said something to her and she was like, you're grounded for a week. You're missing out on basketball. You're not playing netball. You're da 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 And so that lasted. And then I stopped. Oh, stopped. Stopped. Okay. Uh, until stopped. I got to um, Ireland. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sevens was oh. what I, they didn't mind me playing sevens because I had plenty of room to run. But I fifteens like evade any evade dangerous any, yeah. tackles. But my first, uh, my first sevens tournament in New Zealand was scary, because everyone knew me as a touch rugby player. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. So they'd walk past me and they'd go, "Hmm, touch girl, eh? Wait until I smash you." And I'd be like, oh, yeah. good. And I was like, <laughs> Jay's fifteen. Like, Done that. Yeah. <laughs> fifteen years old. I'm like, "Hmm, gotta catch me." And I remember the coach saying, "Just give her the ball early," and then I just ran and wouldn't let anyone catch me. But yeah. Oh, I scary. wouldn't. I don't have the skills to hide. <laughs> to, to have been like subtle enough to be like I'm just going out to whatever like I got a black eye in my first yeah. ever rugby game oh. and so yeah I lacked the anyway yeah my parents were happy that I played any kind yeah. of sport so that was even though they still haven't a clue about the offside rule when it comes to rugby but they're very sportive so yeah <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll delve into rugby world cup stuff but first it's women's sports, so let's talk about the women's team. Um, disappointing. So the, World, the Women's World Series, Sevens World Series, kicked off in Glendale at the weekend. Um, not the best start for the girls. Um, eighth, came eighth out of twelfth. Um, but so, some, uh, obviously some wins. Um, uh, did you watch any of the games yourself? I did. Some wins, one win. Did they win one? Uh, they beat Brazil. And then they lost their... Quarterfinal. Quarterfinal. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah, I did I did watch them, you know. Um they're just at a different level. I mean, you look at the top three teams. Those girls in the top three teams are just so skillful. Who are top three? Just to... New Zealand. Yeah. USA won it. Yeah. Australia second and New Zealand came third. At and this then tournament. Got, yeah, it, it, it's actually it's not the same. Like you you would have always at least one of those three up in there anyway, but mm. then Canada would be competing, um, France, France and England. Be, yeah. England, maybe England, not, not so, so much. Not so much this year. Um, but it's early days. Yeah. Um, so when you say like eight out of 12, it's kind of disappointing. Where would you, what's the baseline that you expect? Dietrich to be at or? Well, like they've had, they're in, they're, they're, they're semi professional for since 2013, 13, 2014, 14. maybe. Yeah. Um, so it's Olympic. Sport Ireland yeah. funded um, we didn't get to qualify for Rio and, and that was you know early days we were building yeah. um, and then Tokyo we didn't qualify um, before the summer we missed out in qualification which is really disappointing um, so yeah like I think yeah it, it, it's, it's really hard to kind of put a place on it because you see the level of where yeah. other teams are at mm. um, and like there is some fantastic players coming through like Anna Doyle, we're playing at Leinster. You've got some like really skillful There's girls. There's some nice players coming through. The young, the night, the good thing will be in a couple of years' time seeing these young girls. You look at Australia and New Zealand girls. They play touch rugby from when they're kids. So any of the good Aussie girls have come from a touch rugby background from playing from their when they're five years old, and then they've transitioned into rugby. So they've already got the skills. Yeah, but then you've got the <laughs> likes of US, USA who haven't done that. No. So no, and then they're, they're still able to win. Still able to win because they've. No, I'm not going to say that athletic more. They've just got an awareness. They've done their homework on the and they've nailed their skill sets of where they needed to play play rugby. And they've got girls that are fast that actually can move a ball as well. So that makes a difference. We're going to say they're more athletic. Yeah, but, but that's, I think that's fair as well yeah. because they are they are taught how to be an athlete from a really young age. Like they focus on skill development. You know, universal. Exactly, sorry, exactly. Like yeah. universally across all sports. And then once you have those down from a really young age, like you can then mould. Rugby is hard. Like those skills are difficult to acquire if you don't have some sort of natural base as yeah. well. But if you have the fundamentals at a very high level at a young age, like that can totally be done. I'd yeah. say. I think especially it's, with sevens, you've got you you've got so much space. You've got a lot more as well. So like if you've got speed, yeah. it's a huge advantage. And you know, so it's, it's like it's less tactical sevens. As well, there's a lot more, you know. The, the, more space. There's you can manipulate yeah. the defense, you know, a bit more and things like that. But as you know, if you look at the Aussie girls playing or the Kiwi girls, they'll run across the pitch. As soon as they see a defender change the angle, a girl will switch back inside. 
they just read the play that way, whereas I don't think our girls are at that. But I think if we look back into the school systems, I don't think our PE here is catering for our school girls. I, when I went to uni in the UK, <laughs> they had, so it was like as for PE qualification, we were out on the track. Like these, it's a, like amazing um, facilities over there and they... I think about it now and I'm like it's actually really bad they were like <laughs> they, they were like oh um, any any Irish students uh, over here and the class was like maybe 30 and maybe two or three of us were like hey, hello <laughs> and they're like oh great um, so yeah you guys don't know how to run and we were like yeah. oh and they, they did like a demo at, like and we didn't know how to mm. run like you're not taught and it's it's like yeah I can get from A to B and I'll run as fast as I can but it was only in 20. 14 that we were taught, taught like sprint and, and by then like your natural you've game already got run, your I've already got my yeah. terrible habits and um, which yeah it does it does like even looking back now I look back at like do you know when you're doing your reviews and you're like oh it, around before just before the first half I had a really nice break and I got a bit of and you look back and you're like five yards and I thought I was running like the wind <laughs> and it was basically like that Let's quick the time I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah um, yeah, that's true. And then, so sevens, stuff to work on. Uh, the 15s team, uh, one test coming up. So Six Nations ends in March. Um, I actually love rugby, so I've been following yeah. all good. Nothing, nothing, nothing for summer. No summer tests. Nothing, nothing, nothing around autumn. And then one November test. Yeah. They have a lot of camps. They have a lot of camps. I'll give them that. But you don't learn how to play rugby by training. And I think that's a big problem for Irish women's rugby is, one, they don't have enough club rugby. So the girls that are involved in the national team, I don't think get to play, go back to their clubs and play enough rugby. I remember when I first started, we were pushed back. Because that's, you know, by playing, by playing the sport that you're actually in is the way you learn. You can't learn anything by training week in and week out, unfortunately. And them only having one test isn't going to get them prepared for a Six Nations, unfortunately. You can you can do all you like on the training pitch, but until you start playing games, you know, game management's one, one area that you can't figure out on a training pitch. Pressure of scrums and that, you can't figure out against a scrummaging machine. You know, so I think one, one test match for the girls is a bit of a letdown. That's such an you understatement. Know, yeah, it's I just, it's Did so you mention frustrating. Scotland had two? Did you say that earlier? So Scotland, Scotland have, They've just, have just, they have two and yeah. they're going to get, I think they've got more, more, I think they've got more schedules as well. So, and it's, it's huge because, so Ireland have a one test game against Wales, then they've got a training game against France and a training game against Scotland. Like it's completely different how you prepare, like the, mm. playing a test game you, you all the nerves, all the build up, mm. everything you need to experience because that's what it's going to be like yeah. in the Six Nations, and that's and a friendly in a training game is, it's like oh we can try these moves here, we can try this play here, you know there's not that pressure of performing. This needs to work but, at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what needs to be done in that area. Who knows? I mean, they got invited away last year for a test match, didn't take it. Um, and that could be down to funding. I'm not too sure. I'm not going to really comment on that. But you they, know. like last year, I think we sp I spoke about this before. And um, they, the Ireland men were playing a summer test against Australia. Three games. The ARU invited the women's team. Yeah, I heard that. Irish. And said no. Right? Is said it, it's, no. Uh, sorry, I know you said you don't want to get into it. It's just fun. Is it must be funding, right? Is it money? I is have this money? No like, idea. I don't know. Why what, would you? Why, why? What is the problem here? Like, why? There's so much. Discussion about like there's so many issues with women's rugby and and the decline. Like and I know enough about rugby as a fan, but like most people involved mm. in sport would know that the women's team peaked 2014 and some or sorry 2016 was that 2014 2014 2014 and there's been a gradual decline since, despite the fact that more players are playing, the conditions getting better. So if they're going up, it all it's money. It has to be money. Well, Is like that, it's just like and as well as that, you you see now that like doing what we did in 2014 is not good enough anymore. Like every team is progressing and pushing and wanting those one percenters all the time. Mm. So what worked five years ago or what was invested five years ago is, is not good enough now. Yeah. We should always be trying to push and, and get that bit better. Um, but Looking back at the 2014 team, and it's funny, someone else pointed this out to me and, and 
I'm not going to name who he was or where he works or anything like that. But if you look across the team, they had better, not better, they had more players that could run a game. So, okay. you, you know, you had more uh, leaders. More okay. leaders. Okay. You know, you had Fee, you had Jill, you had Paula, you had Hob, you had, I'm going to put myself in there because I have to because I'm a nine. You had Nora, you had Lynn, you had Grace, you had Briggsy. So there was nearly 10, nine or 10 on there that could run, run a match. So if one of us went down, there was always someone else to step up. Then if, you, do you know there's more game management? Yeah, Does and, but, then you, but then you look at that as well and you have like all of these players had X amount of caps, caps. behind them. So it's not like, okay. you don't, Nora didn't come into the squad no. and get into that fly half position and be, do the business. She started on the wing and... Like and I even, went into that tournament yeah, I going think, on 48 caps, which is quite a lot. So I, I think that it's unfair to... It's unfair to ask a girl, a woman that's played six games. Cat games, cats. Or it could be, or it could be sometimes even like some some players have played less than fifty games of actual fifteens rugby or whatever it is. Yeah. Like you can't expect them to have be four phases ahead of a, in a game when they're so new they to the game. That's oh, my yeah. that's my point. So they, we had the experience. We had built up the experience because we had played a lot of rugby. Whereas the girls okay. now, unfortunately, haven't got the experience to learn those types of skill sets. Like, but I guess it'll come in time, right? If they get games. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, but the other point, the other issue we have in women's rugby is the coaching at lower levels as well. You know, we need to up help those. The RFU needs to get in a bit more and help those coaches within club rugby to get them. Those girls shouldn't have to go to Adam Griggs to learn how to pass a ball. Mm. or learn how to tackle or do all the basics. That should be done by the club coaches. He should be getting these girls at their prime where he can start doing their game plan, their, you know, working on their moves or whatever. He shouldn't have to go in and teach them how to tackle again or if they need that, I don't know. A lot of them can tackle, Senior and them are great tacklers, but that's just... Yeah, you, you know, know what you I mean? Want, you want to go into a camp and have the fundamentals sorted so you're sharpening yeah. rather than like building a weapon. You're like, you're good to go, yeah. let's just home. Yeah. And like this, like the thing is as well, like the the team that they're building now, they're they're a talented bunch. Yeah. And like when you're watching the inter pros so and stuff, players, there's like yeah. there's some like really solid performances mm -hmm. there as well. It's just yeah, I think like just you just want more game times if you give mm -hmm. if you give this team the opportunity to play more. And and yeah. it's not just. But um, we used to play. We used to play against a possibles, a probables and possibles. We, and that used to be a hard match because it was other girls wanting to get break into the squad, you know. But we used to play that twice, I think, I, two times, three times maybe. I think I remember that. Yeah, that was kind of grim as well. Yeah, but, but you know, because you're playing against girls that want your position, so that actually makes a really hard like match. Like ABB kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I just don't think they play enough rugby. And it's not their fault at all. It's the way the RFU, yeah. the RFU have scheduled things, and I'm, I'm sure there's a really good reason behind it. Because, you know. Money, money, money. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> and I'm just going to move swiftly along because, oh, and what, would you hear about the, well, like, positive, whatever, typhoon? Do you yes. hear what's going to happen if yep. the typhoon you hits? You told me this before we came in. Shocking. Yeah. Ireland could be knocked out because of fucking weather. weather. <laughs> like, that's just but so... But why, how would you, how could you do that? How could you go to a tournament and a rule being, if it's not played because of weather... You can be, only Makes it more points. exciting. That's yeah. a joke, by the way. A two bad, points. bad joke. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I feel like we've we've covered a lot. I think so. What's yeah. ahead for you guys, Annie? Before we we kind of make a wrap, like not directly today, <laughs> but like just really you know tired. in general, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Boojum and whatever. Too busy solicitoring and <laughs> you, what teaching. You know, um, no, just look. I'm trying to focus in on getting a bit more coaching under my belt. Um, I was lucky enough over the summer to head home and go and do some coach development out there and spend some time out there and observing what they're doing out there. So that's good. So hopefully in the next six or 12 months, I'll get around traveling oh again. Oh my God, we didn't even get to talk about coaching. Oh my God, I'm such a bad host. Oh, I always do this. I always have like, yeah, we'll touch on this and we'll touch on this. And then I get like sidelined by like, There's yeah. so much to talk about. So much we'll, talk about. We'll, have, we'll get you back. Yeah. So it's all good. We'll have to get you both back <laughs> so and, and go into much more detail on football. And that was perfect. And rugby and stuff. Lads, thanks so much for uh, coming on board and, and walking away. Uh, 
How many, how many likes did we have? Oh, so, got how, what was my total? Six? Six bloopers? Oh, you were really good. Well done. Yeah. Jeez, that's such a hard thing to do. Honestly, Nailed like, it. I don't, know, I don't know how you Nailed do it. Nailed it. Um, thanks so much for the support, guys. Unbelievable. Uh, don't worry, uh, Neve McAvoy will be back next week wrecking her head. That's all for episode 24. Thanks for having a listen.